I hear a lot of talk about legacy, especially in the political realm. I'd like to hear more talk about legacy in the family realm, especially from fathers. The word legacy means something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor or from the past. This is a picture of a legacy. Well, whether you want to admit it or not, the reality is that our lives are passing along something to someone. Each of us has been given a certain amount of time and influence. We don't even realize it, but we're passing that on to a next generation. People are watching us. So that brings up a question today. What did you receive from your ancestors, and what are you planning to pass on to those who follow you? What was it that somebody handed you? What was this thing? What did it look like that somebody handed you? And what are you planning on handing somebody? What are you handing somebody right now, this past week, this past month, this past year? I'm sure that we have all types of answers to that question here in the room today. And you know, I'm not naive. The reality is some of you in the room today, you got junk from your family tree. I get it. And some of you in the room today, you got great treasure. I understand that. But the reality is this, you can't change the past and you can't change the legacy that was handed to you However, you can determine the legacy that you're going to pass on to those who follow you. Yes, you can. If you want to be trapped, and if you want to be trapped in the circumstances of your past, you can be, but you don't have to be. You don't have to be. You still have time because as of right now, you still have today to work on a legacy. I recently spent a lot of time studying the book of Jeremiah, and in that study I came across a chapter that prompted me to do what we're going to do today. It was chapter 35 of the book of Jeremiah, and the story is about a group of people called the faithful Rechabites. I really wonder, does anybody in the room know anything about the story? It's kind of stuck in between two chapters of a totally different topic. But unless you really get the context of chapter 35, you'll never understand what I'm going to talk about today. Because chapter 35 is stuck in between two scenes. Chapter 34 is a scene. Chapter 36 is a different scene. And in between the two is chapter 35 about the faithful Rechabites. Let me give you the context. I want to read what comes right before the story. Listen very carefully. Jeremiah 34, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came with all the armies of the kingdoms. He ruled and he fought against Jerusalem and the towns of Judah. At that time, this message came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go to King Zedekiah of Judah and tell him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I am going, I am about to hand this city over to the king of Babylon, and he will burn it down. You will not escape his grasp, but you will be captured and taken to meet the king of Babylon face to face. Then you will be exiled to Babylon. That's chapter 34. Things aren't looking good, are they? It's pretty bad news, pretty bleak. It's the end. Now, jump over chapter 35, and let's go to chapter 36 and see what sandwich is on the other side. God tells Jeremiah to write down the things that are going to happen and give it to the king of Judah. Jeremiah does. He writes it on a scroll, just like God told him to do, and he takes the scroll to the king because God said so. And give the scroll to the king. The scroll is an announcement of all that's about to happen so that you'll be able to be prepared for it. I wonder how the king will take that message. Jeremiah 36, verse 21. 
the king sent Jehudi to get the scroll. Jehudi brought it from Elishima's room and read it to the king and all the officials as they stood by. It was late autumn and the king was in the winterized part of the palace sitting in front of a fire to keep warm. Each time Jehudi finished reading three or four columns, the king took a knife and cut off that section of the scroll. He then threw it into the fire, section by section, until the whole scroll was burned up. Neither the king nor his attendants showed any sign of fear or repentance at what they heard. Even when Elnathan... Deliah and Jeremiah begged the king not to burn the scroll. He wouldn't listen. No fear. Jeremiah has come and said, Nebuchadnezzar's coming. We're being judged by God. There's a time now to repent. There's a time now to turn to God. And, and the king just cuts the scroll and burns it. Cuts the scroll and burns it. Cuts the scroll and burns it. Uh, he doesn't care. There's no repentance. There's no fear. Why? Why? You, you have to ask the question, why in this scene, in the midst of this great tragedy, Jeremiah receives the word of God, hands it in writing to the king, why no repentance, why no fear? Only one reason, there can only be one reason, they don't believe it. If you believe Nebuchadnezzar was coming, if you believed he's going to capture the city and burn it to the ground, if you believed that, you would repent but they don't believe it. Destruction waits on the horizon just over the hill. God sends a warning through Jeremiah, and the king throws it in the fire and sends his soldiers to do what next? Go arrest Jeremiah, the messenger of God. Yeah, let's shut the preacher up. That'll fix everything. Let's just shut the preacher up. Things aren't looking very good around Jerusalem, are they? Chapter 34, 36. But here's the story today. In between these two scenes, we find chapter 35 in a group of men who understand the importance of this right here. Had the whole nation understood the importance of this right here, they wouldn't be in this situation. The importance of a legacy. If you don't throw it in the fireplace, you can learn a lot from what I'm about to read to you today in chapter 35 of the book of Jeremiah. Are you ready? Say, uh-huh. Here it comes. Verse 1. This is the message the Lord gave Jeremiah when Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, was king of Judah. Go to the settlement where the families of the Rechabites live. And invite them to the Lord's temple. Take them into one of the inner rooms and offer them some wine. So I went to see Jazaniah, son of Jeremiah, the grandson of Habazaniah, and all his brothers and sons representing all the Rechabite families. I took them to the temple and we went into the room assigned to the sons of Hanan, son of Igdaliah, a man of God. This room was located next to the one used by the temple officials, directly above the room of Messiah, son of Shalom, the temple gatekeeper. Listen, church. I set cups and jugs of wine before them and invited them, the Rechabites, to have a drink. Anyone curious so far? What's going on? What's God up to? You see, Jeremiah didn't come up with this idea. Let's go find the Rechabites and bring them into the temple. What's God doing? Why has God brought this Rechabite family and offered them a wine party in the temple? What's he doing? Why is this recorded in the middle of all this trouble in Jerusalem? And why am I reading it today on this Father's Day? Rechabites. Let's see. I'm curious. I hope you are. Verse 5. 
I sent cups and jugs of wine before them and invited them to have a drink. But they refused. No. No, they said, we don't drink wine because our ancestor, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, gave us this command. You and your descendants must never drink wine. And do not build houses or plant crops or vineyards, but always live in tents. If you follow these commands, you will live long, good lives in the land. So we have obeyed him, granddaddy Rechabite. We have obeyed him in all these things. We have never had a drink of wine to this day, nor have our wives, our sons, or our daughters. We haven't built houses or owned vineyards or farms or planted crops. We have lived in tents and have fully obeyed all the commands of Jehonadab, our ancestor. But when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon attacked this country, we were afraid of the Babylonian and Syrian armies. So we decided to move to Jerusalem. That is why we're here. Many years before this scene, there was a man with the full intent of establishing a legacy. Granddaddy Rechabite. Was that legacy from God? Was this calling from God? I don't know. It's not recorded. Or was it something he just came up with on his own? I don't know. It's not recorded. Granddaddy Jehonadab, son of Rechab, had established a standard. Listen to me, church. This man had established a standard by which his family would live. He lived that standard and he communicated that standard to all of his children and his children's children. They were never to drink wine. They were not to build houses. They were not to plant crops. They were not to plant vineyards. They were to be a group of people like nomads, always living in tents. I think the word today is Bedouin, what they call it today in Israel. Granddaddy Jehonadab established this standard of living, and then he did something. Here's the reason. Then he offered a promise to his descendants. He offers them a legacy. Not just a way of life without an outcome, not just a way of life, do it because I do it, but he offers them an outcome. Let me repeat it. I'm going to read verse 7 through 10 again. And do not build houses or plant crops or vineyards, but always live in tents. If you follow these commands, here's the outcome. If you follow these commands, you will live long, good lives in the land. So we have obeyed him in all these things. We've never had a drink of wine to this day, nor have our wives, our sons, or our daughters. We haven't built houses or owned vineyards or farms or planted crops. We have lived in tents and fully obeyed all the commands of Jehonadab, our ancestor. God has came to Jeremiah and he told Jeremiah, I want you to bring the Rechabite family, all the clan to the temple in Jerusalem right before its destruction. That's the scene. Right before Nebuchadnezzar comes and Jerusalem's going to be destroyed and burnt to the ground, before that happens, I want you to gather all the Rechabite clan, this group of people that have decided generationally to live under the authority of granddaddy Rechabite, bring them to the temple. God has had Jeremiah set out cups and jugs of wine in front of this family, and Jeremiah looks them in the eye and says, go ahead, have a drink. Why? To test them, maybe. Why? To reveal something to Jeremiah, to reveal something to Israel, and listen, to reveal something to every person in this room today about the establishment of a legacy. Listen to what happens next. Verse 12. Then the Lord gave this message to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. 
Go and say to the people of Judah and Jerusalem, come and learn a lesson about how to obey me. Why do you think he had Jeremiah go round up all the Rechabites? Because he's going to use them as a case study. He says, come, I want you to tell the entire nation of Judah, all the people of Jerusalem, come and learn how to obey me. Verse 14, the Rechabites do not drink wine to this day because their ancestor Jehonadab told them not to. But I have spoken to you again and again and you refuse to obey me. Time after time I have sent you prophets who told you, turn from your wicked ways and start doing what is right. Start doing things right. Stop worshiping other gods so that you might live in peace here in the land I have given you and your ancestors. But you would not listen to me or obey me. The descendants of Jehonadab, son of Rechab, have obeyed their ancestor completely. But you have refused to listen to me. Some people here, some people listen and some people obey. Some people refuse to hear. Some people refuse to listen and some people refuse to obey. I wonder what makes the difference between some people. Some people will hear the promise of a blessing and they'll believe it and they'll receive it. If you follow this command, you'll live a long, good life in the land. Sounds good. I want a long, good life in the land, so I'll do that. Expecting the promised results. God said, come and learn a lesson about how to obey me. Because he looks across the land and there's a bunch of people that said they know his name, but they never obey him. Why? Because God had promised their ancestors a similar thing, claiming a blessing. You know, Granddaddy Jehonadab, Granddaddy Rechabite, had promised his children's children's children a legacy. If you live this kind of a life that I live, that I pass down to you, you'll have a long, fruitful life in the land. And they believed him. Of all the things, they just believed him. Why? Just because he said it. They just believed it, and they lived it out loud. But the reality is God made a promise, and he's bigger than Granddaddy Rechabite. And he said, if you will obey me, if you will listen to me and obey me and follow me, I'll give you a long life in the land. This scene in Jeremiah marks the end of the nation of Judah. 586 B.C., they were utterly destroyed. Why? You know the answer. Because they wouldn't obey God and claim the legacy offered by their father, God. In fact, when God sent Jeremiah one last time with a warning, the king took it and cut it with a knife and threw it in the fireplace and threw it in the fireplace and threw it in the fireplace. Why? They don't believe it. Go back to their beginning, the people of Israel, when God brought this family of slaves out of Egyptian bondage and offered them a lasting legacy in this land flowing with milk and honey. What is it that would make a group of people listen to their grandfather but refuse to listen to the creator of the universe? What would make a group of people obey a man and deny God. In Exodus 19, let's go back to the beginning of this group of people called the children of Israel. It says, then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, here it comes. If you will obey me 
and keep my covenant. You will be my own treasure, special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. Now, who wouldn't want that? Who would, who would say no to that? If you will obey me and if you will keep my covenant out of all the people on the earth, I will raise you up as a kingdom of priests. I will raise you up as my treasure. I will bless you. I will give you a land. I will give you long life. I will give you protection. I will give you harvest after harvest after harvest. Every good thing that's possible, I will give you. If you will obey me and keep my covenant. But they wouldn't obey him. And they wouldn't keep his covenant. He didn't ask them, Israel. Listen, church. Let's contrast God to Granddaddy Rechabite. God didn't ask them to not drink wine, don't build houses, don't plant crops or vineyards. No, he pretty much told them to do the opposite, didn't he? The opposite. He gave them the promised land. He told them, go build houses. He planted crops and vineyards and told them to go drink the wine. But I'm going to tell you what he did tell them. It's found in Exodus 20, verse 1. And he didn't just tell them. He told us. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourselves an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am jealous God, who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one from your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Why? Why all the rules? Because I want to set you apart from the world. I want to make you different than the world. The world will look at those ten things and go, blah. But I'm going to set you apart. I'm going to sanctify you. I'm going to render you holy. And after I set you apart and render you holy and sanctify you, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to establish you. And I'm going to let you stand on solid ground. And I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And we're going to walk into eternity together. Who would turn that down? Set apart to be different. And now Jeremiah stands with the Rechabites in Jerusalem temple some thousand years later after the law was given to Moses. And it's all about to crash to the ground. 
That law that God gave to Moses that I just read to you, a thousand years it lasted. And now Jeremiah and the Rechabites are in the temple and Nebuchadnezzar's coming over the hill with torches and he's going to burn it all down. It's all going to be gone. Why? One reason. They would not obey him. Could you obey him? Is it impossible to obey him? Is it out of reach to obey him? Ask the Rechabites. Obedience is not impossible. It's not easy, but it's not impossible. King Nebuchadnezzar is going to come tear it down, set it on fire, but before he goes, before he does, excuse me, God assembles this Rechabite family, and I got to tell you, listen to the rest of the chapter 35. Here it comes, verse 12. Then the Lord gave this message to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Go and say to the people in Judah and Jerusalem, come and learn a lesson about how to obey me. Come look at the Rechabites. The Rechabites do not drink wine to this day because their ancestor Jehonadab told them not to. But I have spoken to you again and again and you refuse to obey me. Time after time I have sent you prophets who told you turn from your wicked ways and start doing things right. Stop worshiping other gods so that you might live in peace here in the land and I have given to you and your ancestors. But you would not listen to me. You would not obey me. The descendants of Jehonadab, son of Rechab, have obeyed their ancestors completely, but you have refused to listen to me. Therefore, this is what the Lord God of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, because you refuse to listen or answer when I call, I will send upon Judah and Jerusalem all the disasters I have threatened. Then Jeremiah turned to the Rechabites and said, This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. You, Rechabites, have obeyed your ancestor Jehonadab in every respect, following all of his instructions. And therefore, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Jehonadab, son of Rechab, will always have descendants who serve me. Wow. Everybody else, you're going to be destroyed. But the Rechabites, I'm going to cover and protect and establish your clan. That's a legacy. Did you notice what he said? You will always... Always? Did he say always? That's a life worth living and a life worth passing on to your children and your children's children. Something that lasts always. Fathers, what are you giving your kids that will last always? You give them all kinds of stuff that will wear out. What are you giving them that will last always? That was almost 600 years before Christ. This Rechabite scene. And what does that have to do with us today? Everything. It's called legacy. Legacy, the word itself means something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or a predecessor from the past. Why do you do what you do? This past week. Why do you do what you do? I'm just back from a mission trip, fixing to go to camp this afternoon. Why, why do you do what you do? I wish I didn't schedule them back to back, I can tell you that. Well, why do you do what you do? Well, why are you doing Because somebody passed something on to you. They created a form, a character inside of you. Good, bad, indifferent, I don't know. But why do you do what you do? What makes you make decisions like you decide why do you live like you live? Why do you believe what you believe? Jerusalem fell. And Jesus came. And Jesus died. 
And after he died, he assembled 11 disciples and told them something very powerful and convicting. He offered them a legacy. 11 guys. He offered them a legacy. And he offered it to each of us in this room. A legacy even bigger than anything any wreck a bike could ever throw at you. This one lasts forever. It's found in Matthew 28, and it says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. There you go. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And can I stop for a moment and say, I'm bigger than Granddaddy Rechabite. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Go, go pass a baton to somebody. Go make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But don't miss verse 20. Don't miss the next sentence. Teaching them, teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Teach them to obey. Teach them about the Rechabites. Teach them to obey my laws and my covenants and my ways. If a generation is 70 years, there's been about 28 generations that have passed down this legacy I read to us today. 28 fathers have passed a baton to 28 children. And here we are today. Somebody had to make a disciple who made disciples for us to be disciples today. Somebody in those 28 generations heard the words of Jesus, believed the words of Jesus, and obeyed the words of Jesus and became spiritual Rechabites. In John 14, 23, Jesus replied, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. And anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. If you're struggling with obedience to the Word of God, you're not struggling with something trivial. You're struggling with the very essence of your relationship with God itself. Do you believe Him? Obedience is the only evidence to support your claim of belief. I'm going to say it again. Everybody listen carefully. Obedience is the only evidence of your claim of belief. Did you notice the end of the Rechabite story? Verse 19. Therefore, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, you will always have descendants who serve me. Always is the biggest word I've ever seen. What if he made you that offer today? What if the creator of the universe, the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, came to your house today and said, hey, I want to make you an offer today. If you will obey me, I will make you and your descendants the ability, give you the ability to serve me forever. Would you turn that down? What if he offered you an eternal legacy today? Would you believe him? Would you obey him? Would you pass it on to your children as the treasure of all treasures? Hey, I've been given this ability to serve God forever, in his kingdom forever, to be called his child forever, to be living under the blessing forever. And I'm going to give it to you, Chad. I want to give it to you, Audrey. I want to give it to you, Michael. I want to give it to everybody. This is it. This is the biggest thing we get in life. Revelation 3.10, Jesus comes to the church, and he says, because you have obeyed, 
You know, I'm convinced we're living in a generation we need to be talking a little bit more about obedience and a little bit less about grace. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere. I will protect you, Jesus says, to the church from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so no one will take it away from Take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they'll be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name, and anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Can you hear today, church? Somebody say amen. You got a legacy? You want one? Some of you, if the truth were spoken today, got junk from your family tree, and some of you got treasure. If you got junk, I'm sorry. If you got junk, quit living in your past. It's time to start over. The reality is this, you can't change the past, you can't change the legacy that was handed to you, but you can, by the power of Christ, determine the legacy that you will pass on to those who follow you. If you want to be a whiner, have at it. But you can be a winner. And the generational curse that was handed you can stop in your generation by the power of Jesus' name. Don't you tell me it cannot. You still have time. I'm going to ask Chad to come out. I was gone for almost 10 days. And kind of, you lose touch with reality down there, at least the world news. And I was reading this story about the Rechabites. And in the story of the Rechabites, Babylon's rising, Nebuchadnezzar's rising, Jerusalem's falling. I come home and watch the news. Babylon's falling. To Crete, Mosul being taken over by a group of radical Islamists that are coming through and chopping the heads off of everybody who stands in their way. An army drops their weapons and their vehicles and runs for their lives because of this force of darkness moving across what we know as Babylon, modern day Iraq. So I'm reading this story and preparing as Babylon rises and I come home and Babylon's falling. Kingdoms have come and kingdoms have gone. I watch our own nation and I see America staggering. Once the power and the light of the world is staggering, like in a drunken stupor. Why? Why? What's going on? Why? They have abandoned their God. Even in the church, many say, they say one thing and they live another life. God's called us to be holy, to be set apart, to be different than the world. I see the, the church trying to copy the world or mimic the world. We've been called to live different lives. You think the Rechabites looked like everybody else? They didn't, did they? They stood out, but when God assembled a group of people and said, I want you to be like these people. These people know what it is to be obedient. That was supposed to be the church in the last days. These people know how to obey me. These people know how to serve me. They know how to love me with their lives. These people. Purify your lives, church. The world is staggering. I don't know when he's coming, but the king's coming. You better have your house in order when he arrives. You want a legacy? There is no legacy without Christ. But you receive the baton of life from Him, and then you spend the rest of your days passing it to somebody else. The invitation to this legacy is open. Let's stand, let's sing, let's worship together. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come 
Um, we had a week of camp this week at CLY in Tennessee, and God just did an amazing work in students' lives. And uh, this morning, Raven um, Hutton is going to be baptized. Uh, God's just uh, really been working on her this week. Um, it's just awesome. So I ask you to turn your eyes to the baptistry. Young, be seated. <laughs> 